Today, we're going to talk about Gypsy Rose Blanchard, and we're going to tell you about all the behaviors we see that tell us what she might do next, what she might have done, and things that make her anxious, those types of things, things you'll be interested in uh, seeing when you see them on somebody else. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, there are two videos. One is with Deborah Roberts, and the second is with a couple of podcasters. We'll get to see very different behaviors between those. And if you don't know who Gypsy Rose Blanchard is, she was convicted of second-degree murder in the murder of her mother. She had been held by her mother and treated like she was very ill, lots of drugs, lots of unnecessary surgeries, and she murdered her mother. That's it. I don't hate him. I feel sorry for him. And... Just that somebody could do something so heartless and not express remorse. Is it fair that he is incarcerated for life for killing your mom and you're out? I did my time. He's doing his time for his part and I wish him well on his journey. For Gypsy, prison offered a chance at a new life. You felt freer in prison than you had out in the world. Yes, yes, absolutely. How so? How is that possible? Well, I was able to do the simple things like just sitting in the sun, even in a restricted environment. You can make friends and that is something like I had been kept from my whole life. All right, Mark, this is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, Clem Fandango. Yes, I can right. hear you, Clem Fandango. Yes, okay, I can. what have you got? Uh, what have I got? Look, um, you know how I love a good story. Very clear one is being set up here, one that I call Virtue Unrecognized, which essentially, and, and interestingly enough, is the Cinderella story. It's when within something negative, if you look at it, there's something very positive in there when, uh, you know, a rat can turn into a coachman, a pumpkin can turn into a coach. Somebody who uh, tends fires can be a princess. In, in what's coming across here is it's a journey, not a sentence. It's freedom, not incarceration. There's the sun, not the darkness, and there's friends there, not enemies. It's a complete reversal of what we'd expect. We're expecting from her the darkness of being sentenced. She's saying there was no darkness there. It was a journey. There was freedom, actually, and there was sun, and there was friendship there. So it really is a complete turnaround of our usual expectations of what somebody's experience should be. I mean, if, listen, if that's somebody's experience, why would we ever lock anybody up? It's no punishment, is it? If that's what you get out of it, journey, freedom, son and friends, like what, then, then justice clearly doesn't work in the way that we expect it to. So some purposeful, I would say, turnaround there. The Cinderella story, uh, it's interesting. Later on, she says she grew up on Disney princess movies. And I think we're getting a sense of that. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, let's start by saying, you. some of you are gonna know a lot more about this case than I do because this has been in the media forever. But I did do enough research to know a good bit about her and did see her in the sun, by the way. Her mother put her in, in a hammock in the sun at least one time. So she's been in the sun before. I don't know that she was allowed to most of the time. Let's also talk about abusive relationships. We would probably celebrate if a woman killed her abusive husband who was being very violent. And this mother did some pretty horrific things. So as I go through this, I'm going to point out things that I see and go, hmm, I don't like that behavior. But also remembering that she was in a horrifically abusive relationship, even to the point her teeth fell out from drugs that she didn't need to be taking. So there's a whole lot of things there. The other one is when you're raised by wolves, you act like a wolf. If you think about what's culturally acceptable and what we would today consider not acceptable, for example, the Spartan warriors a rite of passage was to kill a helot, to kill a slave, and they would sneak up on them and kill them. Well, we find that repulsive, but in that culture, not so much. So when you're raised in a culture that is very criminal and very, and this woman was doing all kinds of fraudulent things, then the child's seeing all that. And this child was raised in that her entire time. So we're going to see things that are maybe not normal behavior for us, but might be for her. She also does a lot of, she's the poster child for front of mouth talking when she's talking to Deborah Roberts. Remember I always say you talk like that, you put all the words forward in your mouth and she's doing it because Deborah Roberts is authority. You can see it. You can see, we're going to see a difference in her when she's not dealing with an authoritarian figure versus another. And Deborah Roberts has an adversarial position to her. Mark, you always are talking about that. She's straight across. I would take an oblique 
probably give her a little bit more room and see what happens. As we walk through this, though, there are a handful of things. She's got this elongated verbal. Uh, all of her, her her vowels are elongated as she's fishing to see where you're going. And she parses facts. I did not murder. In fact, she was charged with and convicted with second degree murder. By very definition, that's murder. Now, she didn't do the act. She had a boyfriend who stabbed her mother, but she didn't do the act. There's some cuts and edits in this thing, and I don't usually bring these up, but I think I'm seeing discomfort and probably some restarts in this video, the reason they're piecing this thing together. We'll watch through the one with Deborah Roberts. I think there's there. Mark Urich comes in with, I did my time. He's doing his time, and she does request for approval, and she's punctuating that. But overall, she's locked down. And I think we're seeing a person who deals with authority a certain way, which we would expect because she's been in prison and she's been in trouble. And she had to carry off some kind of pretend life long before she went to prison. Scott, what do you got? All right. We see a lot of those short, single shoulder shrugs. And I think we see them so often. It's part of her baseline now. I don't I don't think they would um, have anything to do with deception or hiding anything. I think she, when she's nervous, she just starts doing that. That shoulder comes up. Uh, as part of her baseline. So have, having watched the entire uh, interview. And for me, that lip licking is prepping for the next question. I don't, you know, it's it's not even mouth grooming. She's just, I think she's just got a dry mouth from the from the interview. And it sounds to me when she's answering, we're hearing everything you'd want to hear in, in that answer from that question. It, it sounds like it's been prepared. It's, it's, she's listened, you know, she's said it and then, Maybe somebody's helped her with it. And then uh, she puts a lot of emphasis on the words hate and sorry. So I thought that was all interesting. But her baseline is what's interesting to me because it's got a lot of things in it that that would usually tell us someone's not being honest about something. But I'm but I'm, I'm not seeing any of those as that as we go through here. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you all. Uh, I think those two shoulder shrugs might be sig slightly significant in that the, the chin turns into the shoulder and this one one of those things that we often talk about i think that was joe navarro uh, came up with that uh indicating a lack of certainty a lack of confidence in what somebody's saying and they're precisely at the moments when she says wish him well on his journey uh so just lacking lacking a little certainty in what that what's going on there and this woman's mother shaved her head to fake having cancer, fed her through a tube for years, and even made her fake being paralyzed for attention and I think money. I think there was some money involved here. I'm not sure. Greg, if, if you've done some research, I don't know. I keep frozen. <laughs> oh, no. <I'm> a... <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's thinking about his car. He wrecked the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it when the technology fails. Ever so I continue. You, You're <laughs> muted, Greg. We we can't hear you. We can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, I, I've got an unstable internet connection. I don't know right. what's causing it, but okay. yeah. right. You know, I spent my entire life trying to keep abreast of all the things that are changing in the world. And being a lifelong learner, I really appreciate our sponsor today, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is a powerful tool, a platform to help you as a lifelong learner. I'm sure you are because you're watching us and trying to learn what we know. It's a tool to allow you to go after any content you would like in a style you would like. So for example, you can choose the length of your content. You can set it for your understanding, your knowledge level of that. And if you overset it, you'll be able to figure that out pretty quickly because the challenges will help you to understand where you are. That ability to take any topic from data analysis to scientific thinking, to logic, to AI, to engineering, there's a list that you can't imagine to a level that you can pick it up in pieces. I always say that humans only learn through process. If that were not true, we could just plug our heads in and learn everything all at once. This is not the matrix. You have to learn in a process-driven approach and Brilliant does a great job of that. I like the scientific thinking module because it teaches you how to think about the world around you in a physical sense. And you'll notice most of the time when we're talking about these people who tell us they've done X or Y, you'll hear a logic piece come in there and their courses on logic. These are all well-developed. These are all intended for you and designed for you. You can choose the length of the course, the frequency of the course, and with the mobile app, you can even choose where you do this course. 
all, of all the topics that we cover on the show, there's the, every one of them has a root in some of the things that are available out on brilliant.org. This is a great opportunity for you. The first 30 days are free and the first 200 people will get 20% off a pass across the entire platform. Great opportunity. Use our link, brilliant.org slash the behavior pen. Don't miss out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So, Greg, there was money involved. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, she got a free house because their house was destroyed by a storm and there probably was some charity and that kind of thing. I don't know all the, the level of detail, but yes, there was certainly okay. lifestyle change as a result of it. So this is uh, a, com- a behavior like this is commonly known as Munchausen's by proxy. Uh, but the technical term for this is factitious disorder imposed on another. That's like the technical term for what that is. But uh, according to the definitions, it's not Munchausen's. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a video that's coming up. She had a childhood that most of us, I think, can't even imagine or start to imagine. There's no doubt that this has some deep wounds that I'm sure shape the way that she lives and views the world today. So I'll be looking for some of these things in the coming videos. And Dee Dee, her mother, uh, had a tremendous amount of control exerted over Gypsy her whole life, uh, which I'm, uh, and this the murder happened when she was 24. The frontal cortex isn't even finished developing uh, at this time. So there's physical abuse Super strict uh, supervision uh, likely probably led to a profound sense of powerlessness and dependency. And in in an adult, once that person grows up, this could result in some serious difficulty with trust and forming any kind of healthy relationship. One of those tape replays. I don't hate him. I feel sorry for him. And just that somebody could do something so heartless and not express remorse. Is it fair that he is incarcerated for life for killing your mom and you're out? I did my time. He's doing his time for his part and I wish him well on his journey. For Gypsy, prison offered a chance at a new life. You felt freer in prison than you had out in the world. Yes, yes, absolutely. How so? How is that possible? Well, I was able to do the simple things like just sitting in the sun, even in a restricted environment. You can make friends and that is something like I had been kept from my whole life. You nervous at all? No, I think I've I've been through so many interviews right now. Does it feel like second nature now at this point? Kinda, kinda. Yeah. Yeah. Has it all been pretty much the same? Like everyone is um, assuming uh, Good Morning America was actually the hardest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of difficult questions in that. And I uh, we just came from The View and I was like, oh, my God, I hope these ladies are not mean to me. <gasps> they were all very, very nice. Uh, how can anyone be mean to you? I don't know. I mean, um, I did some international interviews last night. And one of the, the questions was like, how do you feel now that you're getting all this attention? Um you know, but, you know, you're a murderer. Oh, my so God. like she just flat out said it. it was a lady from the UK. And I'm kind of like, OK, oh. and, and everybody in the room just like jumped up and was like ready to like, am fight. I, you know, fight or am <laughs> yeah. I OK? Yeah. They were freaking out for me. And I'm like, no, no, guys, I got this. <gasps> like, it's something yeah. that I'm going to have to address Yeah, because it's always in my comments. Like, why are we glorifying a murderer and this and that and the other? Yeah. And, um, you know. I don't want to have to remind people every single time that I'm not the one that committed the act of the kill. So, you know, I'm a part of it. Right. But in the state of Missouri, they, there's no such thing as accessory to murder. So technically, they couldn't charge, you they couldn't charge me with accessory because that, that charge doesn't exist. Okay. So, I mean, had I been in another state, I would have been charged with accessory to commit murder. Oh, uh, that makes sense. So, okay. Yeah. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to just point out a handful of things here. She's more open. It's less confrontational. It's also not network TV. This is a podcast. I think they have 170, 180,000 followers. So good following, but I think it's, or subscribers, but I think it is less threatening probably. And they're younger. I think all of that probably comes into play and they're friendly to her. There's a lack of certainty. And and 
Scott, while well, she does this a lot, I think it is a lack of certainty about topics. Well, I think, I think it is too, but I think it's part of her baseline. So it's it's the whole thing is, yeah, is yeah. like when Chase was saying that earlier, I totally agree. But it's just yeah. so often, and we know I, that. I think the reason it's so often is because... She, sorry, I think the reason it's so often is because she has no idea how to behave. That's what I think. Right. You know, she's been, she's been, you put, you talked about it earlier, Chase, when you have been controlled to the degree she had, and then you go to prison, you know what's normal for prison. And we'll see her get more loosened up as she goes through here to the point she says some things that are a little awkward, but she starts off okay. She's illustrating with her whole hands and body. And, you know, she's talking about a person calling her a murderer. And this was funny. This is before they actually started the interview in this case. And in fact, probably is by definition a murderer if you're charged with you know second degree murder it's still murder but you can you can see that she is comfortable with these guys she's starting to do it. one thing to remind you and I'm, this takes nothing away from how she's doing here when she was 16 years old she was faking intellectual disability i mean she was go watch the video so if you're doing that your whole life it takes personality to overcome that natural tendency to want to do what you've always done. I always fish tastes like what it swims in. Organism does what made it successful. But she doesn't appear to be doing this here. You hear she's talking not in the front of her mouth. She's further back. She's talking comfortably. She's illustrating. She's telling these people how she felt in this interview. And she says that Good Morning America video was the toughest she had done. So probably a good indicator. We see those weird cuts is because they're having to restart and do and change and seeing her hands jump around. So let's look for this and see if she's more fluid in this one. Chase, what do you got? Y'all ever notice when some legal stuff is about to come out of somebody's mouth, the words in the state of are always first. But every other time it's just in Missouri, in Texas. But it's in the state of, I don't know why we do that. That's attorney like talk. Every, yeah, everybody does that, even me. So, but I think her wondering if the interviewers would be mean to her makes sense. Her experiences with her mother, who was the primary authority figure in her life, being abusive and manipulative, I think would probably lead to a distrust of authority figures, which TV people tend to be, especially in this country. There's a lot of hygienic gestures from her desire to maybe improve her appearance. And this little hair pulling back thing has become exponentially more common. Have you guys noticed this on mm -hmm. TikToks and this, uh, this little thing here is super common. And we'll see a little bit of lip licking here, but and that's a hygienic gesture too, which is sometimes a stress response. But it's I'm not seeing deception. The guy in the sweater, though, was way more fascinating to watch than anything else. He is incredibly nervous in this video. The clothing adjustments, the blink rate through the roof, and we blink more often when we're stressed, and he is blinking so rapidly, the sipping on the water. And while he's sipping, looking over at her like this while he's, while he's doing that, uh, suggests a lot of nervousness and stress. He's also... Lip licking, the hygienic gesture. He's rotating back and forth in his chair. He does facial denting. I think that's another Navarro uh, coined yep. phrase, which is a stress uh, a stress response. And this is one of the biggest stress clusters I've ever seen, and it's not even the person we're analyzing. Uh, and his breathing rate, when you get back to this video, when it comes back on your screen in a minute, watch his chest and tr and do what Mark says every once in a while. Try to breathe along with him. Try to match his breathing rate and see how you feel. Maybe there's some kind of arousal there. It could be because of the stress, the podcast, could be some kind of physical arousal there. But it's followed by an immediate attempt to conceal it, which then makes the stress level even higher. So I think this video really shows us even with a mountain of stress, stress isn't just about deception. This is an incredible demonstration of this. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, same as you, Chase. I thought it was kind of odd. The behavior is quite contagious. He says, you nervous now to her, and then instantly shows, just as you said, a whole packet of you know, potentially nervous behavior. So does his, as I understand it, his partner uh not only in in um in interview but 
life partner across and the subject, suddenly all of them, uh, they're moving in their chairs. There's coat movement, there's hair movement, there's nails, there's water, there's the microphone movement, there's clothing. It's just a contagion of, of indicators of nobody being comfortable. And, and and that's kind of odd because the interviewers here should be pretty comfortable. I mean, I assume they do this most every week. And so well, what, is, what is the discomfort about? You know that it's professional because they have got podcast these. mics. You've got yeah, these yeah. sticking out. You've got headphones. <laughs> that's how you know. Yeah, yeah, Honestly. yeah. That makes me assume they're doing it once a week. You yeah. know, they've got... They've got the the shore mics there. They've got the headphones. So it's kind of, you know, it's odd. Anyway, um, in the state of, yeah. Uh, no, I assume people say in the state of because in the United States, the laws are not united across all the Correct. across all the states. What, what you can, you know, be put down for in one, one state is not what you'll be put down for in another state. Right. Um, and it's interesting how she kind of goes, well, technically I'm not a murderer. Well, I think it's like you say, Greg, I think technically in that state, she was, yeah. um, but but she has some kind of technicality where she says, "I didn't, I wasn't actually holding the weapon, and therefore it's not. I didn't do it." Well, I think in that state, you you're not just an accessory; you are you are party to it, and 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 you. It was yeah, it was murder. Okay, interesting. Um, so it seems to take no responsibility around around that. Uh, yeah, so contagion, no responsibility. Very interesting. Let's see how we carry on. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Since these are two different interviews we're looking at here, the, the first part of this of the second interview, the one that happened later, um, compared to the other one, she's really relaxed. She's calm. She's prepared. She has no problem getting right into engaging. I think the problem you guys are, are talking about with the uh, interviewer with a guy, because I thought about that as well, because watch his thumb, man. It's all over that that oh, yeah. armrest. <clears throat> I think he they don't they're trying to remember the questions. That's what he's trying to do. Make sure he's got his questions right, because I don't see him reading from anything. I, th I think she gets on the phone one time. His, his wife gets on the phone one time, and maybe that's what she's looking at. But I think maybe he's worried about the. I would assume he maybe he's worried about the questions he's getting ready to ask. Make sure they're in the right order. Making sure he's not leaving anything behind, so the whole thing makes sense. That's the only thing I can come up with because he's so uncomfortable during this. You want a data so, point? Yeah, she comes out of the gate before he starts asking questions with stuff he's going to ask later because he comes up again later. I think what he's trying to control, it, but it's amazing how much it shows. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. a data point. She jumped out of the gate because I watched the whole interview. Yeah. And back to that single shoulder shrug thing we were talking about. I think uh, Joe Navarro was talking about when there's when that single shoulder shrug goes up and the chin goes toward it. That's when you're asking about something, uh, whether they're being deceptive or not. I think that's what that is. And then the normal sh single shoulder shrugs are, are what we, as we always do, uh, put those behaviors in the category of being unsure. But the other one is, is deceptive. And that's and that's when I started looking for that. I finally I said, Dad, go ahead. He's right about that. So that that's where I got I I saw that as well. But uh so we're seeing quite a few adapters from her. This lets us know she's she's stressed, but she's she's trying I think this is easier for her because it's people her age and they're not asking her questions about her about the murder, whether she did it or not. Whereas in the other interview, I think those her questions are, are a little bit more uh, hardline. They're a little bit more aggressive than, than these two are. But we see that that finger to her face. We're seeing her rubber thumb and finger together. All these things let us know she's stressed. She's got great eye contact, but she's got low and she's got low blink rate. So and again, Chase, like you're talking about that hair thing. I think that's one of those little um, almost like a virus, a behavior virus that goes around when somebody sees it, they start doing it too. So maybe since she's got so many TikTok um, followers, maybe she's on TikTok all the time. Sees all those the, the the girls on there doing their hair like that. Maybe she's doing that too. Maybe yeah. that's the reason for that. I would. That's the only thing I could I could come up with as well. I mean, go down a couple other roads, but I think that's one. That's what I think is happening there. Uh, the, we're seeing the behaviors of 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 nervousness and low level stress, but these are the ones that are normal for any interview. One thing I noticed, and, and you guys start watching this too, unless you observed it as well, as we go through these, and it's and she's talking to this to, to the the couple there, she doesn't answer questions to him. He'll ask her a question, and she answers everything 
to the woman, which I thought was really odd. She doesn't engage with him as much as she does the woman. He'll look right at her and she'll look right at him. He'll ask her a question, then she'll turn to that woman and start answering, which I thought was fascinating. Um, but overall, we can see she's uncomfortable because she's. She, I think she's trying to get these people to like her, and she's gotten good at that because of the way she was raised. She's been put in a, a situation where she has to make people like her and and okay the way she's she's um, acting because she knows in her heart, for a lot of it, it's not real, that it's not true. She's older than when she was acting younger. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Uh, no classic behaviors that let us know she's on guard or under a great deal of stress. I keep talking about that, but I think that's important. She is stressed, but uh, but she's not rubbing her hands on her legs and getting real still and staring him down or staring her down. It's just everything looks as it should for the normal nervousness of someone meeting a couple of people, and then she's being interviewed at the same time. Her voice tone and cadence, they don't indicate stress. Nothing is too loud. We see a couple of weird laughs, but nothing. she doesn't laugh too loud and, and not out of context so and, and all these kind of things like that disappear as she settles in the, the more relaxed she gets the the odd laughing and all that stuff sort of disappears then her voice tone gets lower and lower as she goes through this interview which lets us know she's relaxing as well uh, but they're markedly different in this interview than than in the other interview one of those tape replays you nervous at all no, I think I've I've been through so many interviews right Does now. Does it feel like second nature now at this it point? Kinda, kinda. Yeah. yeah. Has it all been pretty much the same? Like um, everyone is. Assuming uh, Good Morning America was actually the hardest. Really? Yeah, there was there was a lot of difficult questions in that, and I uh, we just came from the view, and I was like, oh my god, I hope these ladies are not mean to me. <gasps> they were all very very nice. Uh, how can anyone be mean to you? I don't know. I mean, um, I had did some international interviews last night. And one of the, the questions was like, how do you feel now that you're getting all this attention? Um, you know, but, you know, you're a murderer. Oh, my so God. like she just flat out said it. it was a lady from the UK. And I'm kind of like, OK. Oh. And, and everybody in the room just like jumped up and was like ready to like, am fight. I, you know, fight? Or am <laughs> yeah. I OK? Yeah. They were freaking out for me. And I'm like, no, no, guys, I got this. <gasps> like, it's something yeah. that I'm going to have to address because it's always in my comments. Like, why are we glorifying a murderer and this and that and the other? And, um, you know, I don't want to have to remind people every single time that I'm not the one that committed the act of the kill. So, you know, I'm a part of it. Right. But in the state of Missouri, they, there's no such thing as accessory to murder. So technically, mm -hmm. they couldn't charge you. They couldn't that. charge me with accessory because that, that charge doesn't exist. Okay. So, I mean, had I been in another state, I would have been charged with accessory to commit murder. Oh, that makes sense. So, okay. Yeah. Not everyone chooses to learn from their mistakes, mm -hmm. but you clearly were someone who seems like they tried to make the most of their time while in prison. And yeah, do you remember that moment? Was there an epiphany of like, I don't want to be this person. Mm -hmm. I actually want to take accountability for the role I played mm -hmm. and not let this define me. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a there was a class that I took and it was called um, ICVC um, and it's called it's a, an acronym for um, impact of crime on victims. Okay. Um, and I took this class. It was a 12 week class and it, it's all about accountability. And so as I was going through the courses, I realized that I had made mistakes before my crime. I had made choices before my crime. Um, and I. I feel like even though I didn't get in trouble for those things, this was a chance and an opportunity for me to honestly learn from those things that I've done in the past. So, and I completed that class and actually went back to teach the class. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, was, it was really enjoyable for me to pass the baton on and just kind of yeah. like teach others what I have learned. It was a, a very impactful class for me. And it, I think it's sad, you know, there are people that don't, want to better themselves. But for me, it was always known. It was, it was part of that freedom to do, you know, things with my life that I've never done before. So one of the first things I did was, you know, get into GED classes because I wanted to better my education. Mm -hmm. All right, Chase, what do you got? I, I have no idea why I hate vocal fry so much. 
Uh, I think maybe because it's just deliberately fake and artificial. I'm not sure. Uh, but her up talk, the use of like all the time, the vocal fry, all combined indicate to me that we're seeing somebody who's heavily and easily influenced by trends and fads in popular culture. So this little bit of information can be a huge lever to an interrogator, a huge lever. So her behavior, though, uh, looks mostly honest. I think there's a genuine feeling that uh, she's got of the desire for freedom. And based on her seemingly captive childhood, it makes sense that any form of freedom uh, would feel pretty amazing. This looks mostly honest. Scott? All right. I think it's interesting that she's so relaxed here. And she's got her arm on that chair, just all lean back, and she's illustrating with that hand. I thought that was that was pretty interesting. So it lets us know she's starting to feel comfortable. She's she doesn't have a problem, I think, um, as she's learned to get along with other people, meet people, and and mix in with them, you know, or or become part of the group or be part of something. So I think she's pretty behavior, or pretty pretty behavior. I think she's pretty relaxed. And this sort of behavior is reserved for the competent. So I can sit there and go, oh, and, you know, lean back and just start talking about, you know, I'll tell you what I think. So the competent people usually do that. So I think she her confidence is building uh, so far. And she looks fairly normal for what's happened to her, I think, at this point in, in a conversation. And she says, I made mistakes before my, my crime. I made choices before my crime. These are when she says these, it's classic fading facts at the end of these. And I think that's because she doesn't want to, um, she doesn't like living in that, in the world of thinking about all those things. So it kind of bothers her. So that's why it kind of gets quiet at the end because she's normal. She's a normal person just talking until those, until those things come up. She talks, talks about a murder she's involved in. So it starts getting quieter there. Um, I'm trying to think of, of, of an example We've seen that same thing before, not just fading facts, but somebody who's trying to fit in. I, I just can't think of one. Anna Delby. Um, okay, that's it. That's where we've seen it. Okay, yeah, you're right. I knew there was one, and yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't find it anywhere. But again, this is different behavior than we saw in the first in the first interview, and it's a lot more relaxed. And she's, she's, I think she's gaining confidence as she goes along. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think there's some quite masterful maneuvering around the focus of the question here or the talk, which is around, uh, I would say, responsibility around the murder. She goes to that she's done courses on accountability and that actually she ended up a professor. Well, she doesn't use the word professor, but I'll use that word. She ended up teaching the course on accountability. Well, accountability is very different from responsibility. With accountability, it's like accountancy. You say, look, you know, I promise you will get two. And then you work out, well, did I get to? Was, was that person accountable to me or accountable to themselves? What did they say they would deliver and what did they actually deliver? Responsibility is really, you may not work out beforehand what you're going to deliver, but you knew you delivered it. It's like, I take responsibility for what happened there. Accountability, I look back on time and I go, what did I say would happen? And here's what happened. I'm accountable for that. She also talks about mistakes before my crime and puts the stress on before. So she wants to maneuver around that, learn from those. So she lear she, she's learned from the mistakes before her crime. She's not saying she's learned from the mistake of her crime because she's a count. She was, she says she, she's taking no account for that crime. She's taking account of the crimes before that crime. Uh, and, and very big stress on teach the class. This for me is a is a is a really good redirect. Uh, she, you know, Scott, I can I, I I completely agree that she may not she may be uncomfortable going into that world of the mother's murder, but I think that's why everybody's interested in her. So I mean, are you you know either you're utterly naive and there's a good there'd be a good argument for her being totally naive that the only reason people are interested in her is she's is matricide it's one of the biggest stories ever you kill yep. your mother it's it's a huge taboo you're not meant to do it she did it and so people are fascinated with with that so it would be naive to go actually I don't really want to talk about about 
that. I'm a bit uncomfortable in that. Well, that's what people are going to talk about uh, for sure. Uh, but, you know, there is this other part of, a, as everybody's saying here, which is about freedom and and betterment. And why not? We can understand why she wants freedom. And there's nothing better than being better than you were the day before. I can't think of a better thing than 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 seeking that. But again, it all seems a little bit of a misdirection to me. Greg, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, I think two things. She, this is a rebranding exercise by any means. She's coming out to rebrand herself and say, hey, I'm this changed person. Probably is a changed person. I mean, you. she appears to be. But it is clear that she also is aware of the fact that she cannot have this branding exercise without the mistakes in the back in the past. And if you want to hear that, just listen to those two. Scott, I agree with you. While they're fading facts at the end, they start off powerfully. The two most powerful words she says are mistakes and choices. So she's saying, boom, boom. Yeah, I did do this, but so she knows that she can't come to this dance. Look, if she if that woman were not Gypsy Rose Blanchard and we're sitting there on that couch, what would we be talking about? Not her. We wouldn't be. She's not famous because she didn't kill her mother. You get what I'm saying. The only reason she's at the dance is because of something that occurred. Now, if she had walked away from her mother, she still would be famous because she would have said, my mother did this and. So she's got a rebranding exercise that's a complex thing for her to do. I think she's got all the right answers and she's got in her head what she's going to say. She knows she's going to say, look, I didn't really kill. I caused the, the death. I made some mistakes. I made choices. I've, I'm re, you know, I've, I've been, um, I've been, it was I have remorse. We don't see her saying anything about remorse here, however. But through penitentiary, I've grown, and now I'm a different person. So we watch her, and her whole body's illustrating. That's what we're looking for. Elbows away when she's talking. She's got emphasis in the right words. I agree with you, Chase. She's got one thing that matters to her, and that's freedom, because she's been locked up for two different ways. I say this all the time. When people ask me, where's the one thing I, you know, I die on my sword over? It's being locked up, being locked in a box. I'm not wired for that. I've had it one week. That was enough for me, just like you have, I'm sure. You think back, those days are tough. So what we're looking at is a person who has to come out who has to be believable enough for people to start listening. And we're seeing her adapt and overcome. The Deborah Roberts interview was before this interview, and she said it was one of her toughest. Then she went to The View. She was afraid there. These people are friendly. She's starting to understand how to pitch this lesson. And we're going to look for deviation. And what we are really going to look for is her getting comfortable enough to assume that everybody thinks what she thinks and starts to spew the wrong kind of language. That would be a good indicator. There's something hiding in there that we want to know about. One of those tape replays. Not everyone chooses to learn from their mistakes, mm -hmm. but you clearly were someone who seems like they tried to make the most of their time while in prison. And yeah, do you remember that moment? Was there an epiphany of like, I don't want to be this person. Mm -hmm. I actually want to take accountability for the role I played mm -hmm. and not let this define me. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a there was a class that I took, and it was called um, ICVC, um, and it's called it's an acronym for um, Impact of Crime on Victims. Okay. Um, and I took this class. It was a twelve week class, and it it's all about accountability. And so, as I was going through the courses, I realized that I had made mistakes before my crime. I had made choices before my crime. Um. And I feel like even though I didn't get in trouble for those things, this was a chance and an opportunity for me to honestly learn from those things that I've done in the past. So, and I completed that class and actually went back to teach the class. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, was, it was really enjoyable for me to pass the baton on and just kind of yeah. like teach others what I have learned. It was a, a very impactful class for me. And it, I think it's sad, you know, there are people that don't, want to better themselves but for me it was always known it was it was part of that freedom to do you know things with my life that I've never done before so one of the first things I did was you know get into GED classes because I wanted to better my education much of your life with your mom was built on essentially getting people to sort of empathize with you yeah. how do you convince people that you're not manipulating them now as you and your mom did so many years ago? I don't think I can convince anyone anything. I'm not setting out to manipulate anyone. Your mom has been portrayed as a monster. Mm -hmm. Was she a monster? 
I don't believe my mother was a monster. She had mental illness. Um, she had a lot of demons herself that she was struggling with, and she would have needed mental health care. Do you miss your mom, Dee Dee? Yeah, I miss my mom. I still think about my mom from time to time. After all, she still was my mother, um, no matter what she did to me. All right, I'll go first on this one. So we have closed eye talking, with that, that head moving back and forth, and this looks a little bit odd. However, I think there's a reason for that. I think we're seeing the residual behavior from trauma therapy here, specifically EDMR, which is a treatment for trauma, a, a therapeutic treatment for trauma. And that protocol is, is you have the subject follow your finger back and forth as they talk about the uh, the experience, or you have, like Greg and I talked about earlier today, about uh, how you have that going in your in your ears for some uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's tones you can put it in music and it goes back and forth it's a bilateral stimulation that um, helps bring both sides of your brain together both hemispheres and for, somehow when you re when you connect in that way it helps relieve that trauma or as you relive it somehow it helps wipe that trauma I've talked to a few guys who are soldiers who are military guys that, that have gone through that um, therapy and they've told me how well it works and why you may see something like that on someone because as they think about it there a lot of times like we saw with her when she'd close her eyes we'd see her eyes going back and forth and her head moving just a little bit and i don't think she's trying to read she may be trying to retrieve information or something doing that but i really think it's from that um from the therapy um so it makes sense earlier that we're not seeing that in the other interview because she's not under stress. She's not having to relive those things as uh, in depth as she is here. There's all this stress of this interview, put on top of talking about what happened. And on the other one, there's not as much, there's not much stress at all other than being on camera on a podcast as she retalks about the events that happened. She doesn't get into detail into those, and, and it doesn't get super personal or it does with this one. So I think that's why we're seeing that the residuals of that, which could be, I could be completely wrong, but that, I've seen that before, and that's what that kept reminding me of. We see it a couple of more times, but only in this in this interview, not in the one with the uh, with the couple talking to her. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, one thing, <clears throat> when we talk about eye movement, eye movement means something until it doesn't. And people break eye contact to the right, left, down, or up because they get accustomed to doing it. When I'm talking to you and I need a moment to think, I may not even have to think about anything, but I may tune you out just for a second as I would look away. So I'm always cautious when we're not controlling a conversation and there are this many cuts and edits in a video. This one has a hell of a lot of cuts and edits in it. There's an interesting thing. She starts off kind of locked up and barriered, but she um, she then moves pretty freely as, as this thing starts. But she has a chin jut right in the very beginning. That chin jut looks defiant to me. And there's a cut right in there too, which makes me think, is there something going on between these two? There's a little altercation, there's some stress, she's feeling awkward, something, and they've had to restart the video. So that part comes up, I got your eye blocking as well. There's some language in here that makes me think that deep in her psyche, she still knows she's got those two wolves or whatever you want to call it. She's got what the new model is that she's trying to live and the old model that is hardwired because it's a combination of genes, and upbringing she has to fight. So when you hear that, when she says, I'm not setting out to manipulate anyone, that language is loaded to me. That setting out is a push-pull word, is a negotiation word. And it makes me think that in her head, she probably has some doubt. Now that's fair for somebody in her situation, but in a conversation, in an interrogation, I would go, what do you mean you're not setting out to? Is there a possibility? Because that word is there, it gives you an open door to lean into that. Um, there's, But there's enough stuff in here. She's learned that there's a way of behaving that's different, and she brings it up. She says, I learned from. Mark, you talk a lot about young women and their curved bodies being insecure. When they pan in across her, look at how curved her body is sitting in that chair. You can see she's insecure, she's uncomfortable, and it's really easy to tell. The... Other thing is when they ask about her mother being a monster, look at the sorrow, look at the tips of her brows rise. I Chase, you said it dead when she was talking, it looks real. The, that, that sorrow rises and then you watch her chin drop. She does some distaste, but I think that's in her baseline. That thing she does a lot when she's speaking. And then sadness and fading facts when she asks her if she misses her mother. I, 
it all looks believable. I mean, I think we're seeing a person who knows she's got to rebrand. She knows she has to bring all this to the table. And she probably has some self-doubt, I would imagine, considering the situation, considering what she's been through. And she's sitting in probably something she's seen on TV a million times. I don't know if in prison they got cable, but they certainly have network TV. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, you're right there, Greg. A, a concave abdomen there. Often you'll see it, it, it as a symptom in the head and the shoulders rolling forward. But as you move down the body, you find out it's because of the abdomen uh, retreating, often seen in, in young females, young males as well, but more often in young females, in my experience. Uh, so uh, I agree, uh, this, this kind of closed eye talking going on there. Uh, especially comes up around, I don't think, I'm not, I don't believe. And on the denials and the reasons uh, that she has for her her mother. Well, I, I think this is about the the combat that's going on here. It's a, it's, it's a fairly aggressive questioning. She's bound up really by the interviewer who said, you grew up kind of manipulating and conning. Therefore, how do I know you're not manipulating and conning now? Well, that's a bit of a bind, isn't it? Like, trust me or don't trust me. And she says, look, I don't think that. I'm not, I don't believe. So it's it's a little bit stuck. The question is, a the way of asking that is a very aggressive way of asking it. I mean, what you might do. And, and it's not that the next interviewer won't try the same kind of question just through a different tack in a in a in a maybe a less uh, aggressive way but somebody a little more, more with less agenda in their questioning might just create questions that might reveal somebody manipulating or might reveal them being um uh uh i guess less uh honest or or or, or more of a con a vocal clip there after mental illness and then goes into demons so two ways of thinking about the mother there either mental illness or demons and then struggling with let's expect the demons because that that fits the struggle with demons and then needing mental health care going back to the mental health idea so kind of two reasons put forward as to why the mother is like the mother is so covering a lot of ground there for the audience to say look you may not if if you don't want to go with the mental health thing let's go with the demons if you don't want to go with the demons thing i got a mental health idea for you there covers quite a lot of ground so we might be able to join up to the idea of the mother may not be fully uh at at total personal fault or or knowing fault if if that mother is dealing with mental health or or demons, uh, which I'm not sure whether she's talking about the the literal idea of 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 um, of entities that enter your body from a different realm or the idea of being kind of possessed by a, an attitude or something. I don't know where her demonology goes there, but a lot of bases covered there. So you know, for somebody who is um, who is meant to be in in one story i kind of i i imagine have some arrested development there seems like there's quite a lot of development in her ability to sp spin an idea you know i'm not saying she's being wholly manipulative here but she isn't without the capacity to spin some really solid good ideas and even in this combat situation take the story in a way that's more advantageous to her uh scott what have you got on this one or have we all been i think we've all been haven't we we're done oh chase chase, uh, chase. can i go chase no no you, you can go <laughs> chase you can go you must go and you will go chase okay, okay. this is a huge baseline deviation all we're seeing here is a giant baseline deviation. The stuff we're seeing in this clip is different. It's a change. The eye blocking behavior where she's closing her eyes while she's talking is pretty unusual to see in this context. In so many cases we've covered before, it indicates signs of superiority or someone being on a moral high ground. This one is the other meaning, I think, that we talk about. And that's when you're seeing uh, during this statement uh, making a denial, and it's an indicator of discomfort and stress. 
And alone, it's probably just discomfort with the topic and not deceptive at all. And we are seeing it pretty much in isolation here. And she says, I'm not setting out to manipulate anyone. There's a little, I want you to watch that. When she says that, what the, the shoulder raise is not really a raise. It's like a reflexive jerk upward, like a little jump, which is pretty interesting. And she says, I don't believe my mother was a monster. There's eye closure there again during a stressful topic. Then she says she had a lot of demons. During that one part, there was lip licking with a tongue jut, which we know is our the first way that we ever learn to say no or I don't like this is by sticking our tongue out. I have a one and a half month old baby here and I see it every day. That's uh, a tongue jut. And I finally get to like watch it happen. It's kind of cool. Down left eye movement for internal dialogue, the small blink rate spike to 65 blinks per minute. We blink more often when we're stressed, and the average is about 17. So that's a pretty high spike, but it only, only during that one statement. So this is likely something she believes, but she's really struggling to say it out loud. I don't see a lot of, I don't see a mountain of deception here. And the final deviation from baseline is, do you miss your mom? She's rapidly shaking her head here in a different way than anything I've seen. And I watched a ton of interviews today just to get a good baseline. So rapid head shaking is not deceptive. It's not a uh, super weird thing, but it's a change. And when we see a change, something significant's probably going on in somebody's head. So this doesn't let me read her mind, but I would be asking a follow-up question probably about this thing for sure. One of those tape replays. Much of your life with your mom was built on essentially getting people to sort of empathize with you. Mm. How do you convince people that you're not manipulating them now as you and your mom did so many years ago? I don't think I can convince anyone anything. I'm not setting out to manipulate anyone. Your mom has been portrayed as a monster. Mm -hmm. Was she a monster? I don't believe my mother was a monster. She had mental illness. Um, she had a lot of demons herself that she was struggling with, and she would have needed mental health care. Do you miss your mom, Dee Dee? Yeah, I miss my mom. I still think about my mom from time to time. After all, she still was my mother, um, no matter what she did to me. I think the world has a ton of empathy for what you went through, and I think sometimes the questions people do have, you know, a lot of people have watched the documentaries, mm -hmm. have seen the act. Um, and I think it's that those scenes at the end where you're being interrogated by the police mm -hmm. and you're lying mm -hmm. initially about mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. And so much of that documentary also talks about your mother mm -hmm. and her deceit and her ability to manipulate all so many people mm -hmm. and a, a kind of a, a, a through line or a common question throughout the documentary was kind of, you know, how much of Gypsy's mom is potentially still in you and with mm -hmm. what you learned and, mm -hmm. you know, those behaviors. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that? And is that something that you've actively tried to mm -hmm. overcome? Of course, of course. You know, I lived with her for 24 years of my life and she did things in her life. Um, she shoplifted. Um, there was fraud. Like There was a lot of things, criminal activity that she was doing that I grew up in. Mm, I yeah. watched her do all these things. Um, so for me, it is a conscious effort to, you know, go back in my mind and realize that is the wrong thing to do. This is the right way to do things. I'm reprogramming myself and it takes a minute. Um, I have a pretty clear knowledge of what, right and wrong now, um, the obvious stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but for the things that maybe aren't so clear or the lines are maybe a little blurry, I do have a wonderful dad and a wonderful stepmom and a wonderful husband yeah. that I can ask them questions like, Hey, what do you think about this? And, and also I'm in therapy. So, um, I talk about it with my therapist. I am very raw and honest in, mm. in saying, Hey, I, I know that this was not a normal childhood. Um, I'm the product of someone that was very deceitful. How do I prevent myself from falling prey to, to being like her? I don't think I'm like my mother at all. Um, I try actively not to be. Okay, uh, Mark, I'm going to go ahead and have Chase go first. Chase, what do you got? 
She was manipulated from a super young age to deceive and manipulate as a means of survival. Keep that in mind. Deception and manipulation gained her the bottom two rows of Maslow's pyramid, which is horrifying and disgusting. And I cannot imagine. But it makes sense uh, that it might still be in there. But I don't think she even enjoys that at all. I think there's something else going on. We aren't seeing a lot of sympathy-seeking behavior. And that's the hard wiring that she had for decades. She had this sympathy-seeking artificial behavior, and we're not seeing it. So I think the first one is about identity formation. She lived this life dictated by her mother's deception. So she might face a giant challenge in really knowing her own identity that's separate from the illness and victimhood that was kind of imposed on her. And finally, I think she's using advocacy as a coping mechanism. So I think she her role as an advocate for the victims of, of Munchausen's by proxy could be seen as a way of making sense of her experiences, regaining control over the narrative. And when the sense of real purpose is lost, people kill themselves. This has been proven for thousands of years. There's a lot of honest behavior here, uh, in my opinion. And the things that are outside any norm here are baseline for her and the online videos that I've seen. Greg? Yeah, interestingly, you can tell she's stressed around a handful of things. Watch her foot, her foot. You know, watching her hands, moving her hands. If her hand moves and her foot moves, no big deal. It's body movement. But watch her foot bounce three times, three times. When she says right or wrong are pretty clear, um, I have to make a conscious effort, but I have people I can trust and I ask. Those are bold, big things to say. And like I said, she has to rebrand and she has to talk about these things that are inside in order to rebrand that are uncomfortable. So I think we see good elongated vowels for key phrases that she brings up. And overall, I think it's trustworthy, believable. She's telling you things that in her mind are a big deal that she's telling you. But at the same time, they're big enough deal that they're punctuating. I would lean over and ask, in, in a situation where I didn't trust, I would lean over and ask questions when I see that foot bounce because it would mean something's important to her. But I think because of what she's trying to do, she's trying to tell you, look, and I think it's pretty bold to come out and say, look, I am deeply inside not the same kind of person you are because I was raised this way. I was raised by wolves. And now I have to think about it. I think I have a pretty good handle on this, on the gray areas I can ask somebody else. That's pretty bold. And I, what is she, 32, I think I heard in the in the interview so yeah. 32 years almost that time incarcerated or living in that situation it's pretty well adjusted to be able to come out and say that now we'll, we'll look for more as we go scott what do you got all right the single shoulder shrugs have absolutely vanished we don't even see one and her voice tone has gotten lower and it's lower than it was at the first part we see it go lower and lower and lower because i think she's getting more relaxed as she goes along in here the mouth grooming i think is part of her baseline as she's processing information. One thing I thought was pretty interesting here was we see her looking around the room. I think she's threat checking. I think for some reason she's kicked back into that thing. Something, something could be wrong. Something's going on. Something I don't know about. Maybe she's so relaxed uh, like she was as a child and her mother was giving her all this bad information. Maybe she's relaxed here and thinking maybe something's up. But when I see somebody who looks around the room constantly like that, quite often they're, they're, uh, a victim of trauma or or have have come out of a situation of trauma not not too long ago you know it could be um military people it could be someone who was part of a, was involved in a robbery or some or something like that but i, I see threat checking it isn't just looking around the room casually she's she's checking she's looking around so i thought that was pretty interesting uh mark what do you got yeah so I think this is really interesting, Chase, given that uh, the video before this one, you were saying, look, massive baseline change. And I don't disagree with that uh, at all, because in, in this one, everybody's going, look, seems very, very comfortable. Yet in both interviews, it's basically the same question, basically exactly the same question, but asked in a slightly different way. In fact, very different way and, and a very different manner. The first question that we had there um, 
in the in the previous video um was look you know you grew up a con how do i know you're not conning me now or words to that effect and the interviewer pretty much asked the question within that time span this last video that we just saw most of that was the questioner asking the question it took him a long long time to get out uh you know he starts with look you know a lot of people so he's kind of saying look this isn't me saying this this is a lot of people are gonna say are gonna um say you know you grew up around deception so do you think you'll be deceptive do you think that'll be a behavior you have so it's a much more couched softer way of getting across what is the same question of look you've grown up a con how do i know you're not conning me right now because of course people want to to know that because some people who are following this story my guess is some of them probably not the majority but they they were they were watching the original story i don't know maybe they gave money or they sympathized or they and now they're going hang on i was being conned so how do i know i'm not being conned now um so really interesting uh and and i agree with everybody much karma so it so surely it must be something around the way the question's being asked getting used to these interviews uh much more comfort that means we get a very very different length of answer from her a very different answer different behaviors from her so isn't that interesting in that if you are interviewing somebody and you want to get the truth or closer to the truth in the situation maybe get somebody else to do it as well same questions see what they manage to get out of them maybe choose a different time a different space to do it in because you may find that there's a whole different set of behaviors and when you bring all of those together maybe you'll find out look we we all agree we all agree on this on on what we're seeing or maybe you'll find some dis discrepancies there one of those tape replays I think there's a world has a ton of empathy for what you went through. And I think sometimes the questions people do have, you know, a lot of people have watched the documentaries, mm -hmm. have seen the act. Um, and I think it's that those scenes at the end where you're being interrogated by the police mm -hmm. and you're lying mm -hmm. initially about mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. And so much of that documentary also talks about your mother mm -hmm. and her deceit and her ability to manipulate all so many people mm -hmm. and a, a kind of a, a a through line or a common question throughout the documentary was kind of, you know, how much of Gypsy's mom is potentially still in you and with mm -hmm. what you learned and, you know, those behaviors. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that? And is that something that you've actively tried to mm -hmm. overcome? Of course, of course. You know, I lived with her for 24 years of my life and she did things in her life. Um, she shoplifted. Um, there was fraud, like there was a lot of things, criminal activity that she was doing that I grew up in. Mm, I yeah. watched her do all these things. Um, so for me, it is a conscious effort to, you know, go back in my mind and realize that is the wrong thing to do. This is the right way to do things. I'm reprogramming myself and it takes a minute. Um, I have a pretty clear knowledge of what right and wrong now. Um, the obvious stuff, mm -hmm. um, but for the things that maybe aren't so clear or the lines are maybe a little blurry, I do have a wonderful dad and a wonderful stepmom and a wonderful husband yeah. that I can ask them questions like, hey, what do you think about this? And and also I'm in therapy. So um, I talk about it with my therapist. I am very raw and honest in, in saying, hey, I, I know that this was not a normal childhood. Um, I'm the product of someone that was very deceitful how do i prevent myself from falling prey to, to being like her i don't think i'm like my mother at all um i try actively not to be yeah. one thing you've been very open about is um your relationship with nick mm -hmm. you mentioned the abuse you mentioned just kind of you know some of his dark mm -hmm. desires mm -hmm. something that really bothered me when i was watching the act is he comes across a little sympathetic towards the end. Mm -hmm. They highlight his autism. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about that? Or And despite what Nick did to you and your mother, mm -hmm. do you have any empathy for him being in prison and what he has gone through? 
Um, you know, I, I think that we both, like him and I both have a lot of regrets. Um, you know, obviously I wish that this would have never happened this way. Now for him specifically, um, you know, I did my time. I know he's doing his time for his part of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I hope that whatever he does with his future, because he is spending the rest of his life in prison. Um, I acknowledge that I am the reason for that. However, I don't feel either that it's a situation where it's a sympathetic type of situation. Okay. And I, I mean, and the, the reason why I say that is because in my past relationships, I've had two relationships since I've been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And each one of my exes and even my husband is like, baby, if you would have asked me that question, if you would have said, hey, can you come my mom to get me out of the situation? They would have said no. Okay, yeah. no, we're not doing said, that. Let's go to the police. Let's go let's, to the police. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna get you out of this situation, but let's go to the authorities, all right? And and we're going to do this the right way. He did not, Nick did not say that. You know, he, he has these dark fantasies. He wanted to do it. It was a fantasy he lived out, and he's paying the consequences for that. So with that being said, you know, it's neither here nor there for, in my opinion, what I think of the situation. It's just, it is what it is. All right, Greg. I'm going to have Chase go first. Chase, what do you got? One. I'll quit that. <laughs> I'll quit it. I'll quit it. <laughs> All right. I'll go ahead anyway then. Uh, one, one thing I love about this clip is that it, it shows the power of statement analysis. And she says, I wish it would have never happened this way. And. I thought this was interesting. I think this is showing us escape versus death. Escape versus death. And I think Gypsy's words suggest that she was looking for a way out of her mother's grip. And I don't think necessarily aiming for her mother's death. And she might have hoped uh, for a way to maybe break free from the abuse that she was facing. And now regretting that her freedom came at a high and maybe a violent cost that stood out to me as the number one thing uh, in this video. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I will disagree a little bit on this one because when she does the, that, see that shoulder, it is more pronounced than any other shoulder shrug she's done in the entire time. She says, I wish it wouldn't have happened that way. And the other reason I would say is because I think she shopped. I think she went after a guy. She, she had other dating profiles and all this other stuff was sending pictures to all these guys but this guy that she chose, that she surprised did this, you mean the 400-year-old vampire split personality guy? You're surprised that he did something crazy. Come on. That's irrational. Wait, 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 wait. You got to unpack this vampire yeah. crap. What, is, what are you talking about? <laughs> so she's on a dating site. She runs into more than one person, but she finds this guy, and she starts talking to this guy, and he tells her he's got one of these personalities who's Victor, the 400-year-old vampire. And so um. she... Now courts and brings Victor into the business. That sounds like a throwaway to me. That sounds a hell of a lot like having a game set up. But more importantly, there's in the beginning of this, there's a cut in that video. Did anybody notice that? Really big cut. And she looks annoyed when she comes out of that cut, which makes me wonder, is there some back and forth between them? By annoyed, she exhales, she withdraws the sides of her mouth, and she pulls her head away very quickly. It's just very instant to see it. So she's got this vampire guy that makes stuff to f start to fall on deaf ears for me. I look, she can be recovered. She can be a re you know a, a a person who has turned into the most wonderful person in the world, but still has to lie about some of these key points. And that's what I think we're seeing here. I think she cultivated a persona for this guy, and she shot for somebody she could throw away that was a cutout. If you don't believe that, listen to her word pattern changes and all that shift. When she gets to this, not like it's a sympathetic kind of a situation. She says a whole lot of words. I don't even remember all the words. Chase, you're really good at tracking those. I didn't. But it's not like it's a sympathetic kind of a – that's distancing language for I don't give a shit is what it is about what happens to him. She can't come out and say that because she'll not look like a sympathetic human being. But she is – this is the one piece in this whole thing that makes me believe that she shopped for somebody to do her dirty work. And we're going to hear some language – that may confirm that a little bit later. But yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you've got to rebrand yourself and you've got to talk about the horrible thing you did. 
it's dangerous territory. So there's a chance he could be in prison for the next 400 years. <laughs> Unless he's made to go into the courtyard at sunrise. <laughs> but he has to remember, he's got a split personality. He has to be in the vampire personality when the sun comes up, I guess. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so a lot of control on this one. We've got some some epic steepling. And and you know this is a very controlled gesture. I almost messed it up there. It's so it's so hard to do for for my little brain. We're still so, waiting on Hannah to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, has she has she has she got there yet? Has she developed her That's steepling steepling. reflex as yet? Not there. Hannah's not there yet. We await the steepling reflex to kick in. Uh, so so there she is, steepling. A lot of control there. You know, I acknowledge that I'm the reason for that. Um, she, as, like you were saying, Greg, s- sympathetic for that type of situation, which doesn't, and, and that's put forward because the interviewer has said, well, he came across quite sympathetically. Now, I don't think she likes that at all. She reaches for the water. There's a lot of uh, adapters that go on there. I don't think that's the story she's after, is him being a sympathetic character here. Um, I, I get your idea there, Greg, about her shopping for somebody there. Let me put another idea forward. What if she was shopping, but she didn't expect it to go that far? And in fact, somebody takes control of it and takes it way further than she wanted to control it. And once again, she's not in control of this Situation And now there's a huge amount of animosity for this person who took it too far. And once again, she's in the wheelchair, has zero control of the situation. And this is something she actually wanted some agency over. And so she doesn't want sympathy for this guy uh, because she's gone back and she's done the work of accountability. She knows that pre this crime, she did other things and she can take accountability for that and has he done the work of accountability around that and therefore she is at um she has uh she has the high ground on him right now and she wants people to know she has a higher moral ground than him he took over he did the act she didn't do the murder he's the murderer she's not scott what do you got on this one but she uh, asked him to kill her mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that that's where my theory falls down <laughs> horrifically. <laughs> well, the single shoulder shrug like you guys are talking about is back. And when she talks about Nick, her cadence slows down as well with all that. So it's almost, it's, it sounds like she's, She's asking her Alexa one of those complicated questions about, you know, how many pennies go into a million dollars and things like that, because it slows down. And it's in these little chunks of inf- information as she talks about this guy. And she does a lot of that up talk. A lot of everything ends up in a question. Also, you know, like, it's like if you're talking to Greg and you say, excuse me, sir, your facial expression, it's scaring that busload of children. Like that, which like as that vocal fry gets on your nerves, Chase, that gets on. There's another thing that happens in here. It, gets, it crawls all over me, which I'm, I'm hoping nobody else caught. You probably did, but you might not. You decided not to say anything about it, but I'll, I'll point it out here in a few minutes. But what I found interesting is the dramatic change from confidence to being unsure what she's talking about when she's talking about Nick's situation. So for me, that was a big you know, this isn't an interrogation, so you can't go diving in with a bunch of questions and stuff, and you don't want to get up and leave or something or or break that groove you've got going since they're getting along. But that's a little bit odd to me. And when she steeples and she and like you're you're saying, Mark, she she says, I acknowledge I'm or I acknowledge I'm the reason for that, that up talk again. And she says, all of that's super slow. And then she continues to goof around with her finger, you know, with her index finger. That's sort of reserved for someone who's who's really having a problem with being confident. They'll do this. A lot of times you'll see a kid when when they when something's wrong, they'll play with their hands and they'll find one finger and they'll pull around on that. So that's what we're seeing there as well. So she she doesn't like this subject from all uh, everything we're seeing from her behavior. We, we would see or I would see that as someone who doesn't like talking about that. She's really uncomfortable with it. She, her answers aren't 
as uh, she's not as equipped with an answer of with a ready with an answer as she is for the other stuff for that. She may not have been expecting it. I have no other idea, but I don't think she, I don't think she likes that one at all. And um, it sounds like she's blaming Nick for not correcting her when she was suggesting that he kill her. When she said all these other people would have, it would have said, no, don't do it, you know, call the police or whatever. So it sounds like she's blaming him. So maybe that's, that's the, the part that, that's missing out of this for me anyway. All right, that's all I got. Greg, it's, it's uh, Henry II asking for the Archbishop of Canterbury to be killed. Yeah. And, and yeah. they're going, no, I didn't. I didn't mean it. Who, who will rid me of this troublesome priest? And then they go exactly. off and they yeah, kill the exactly. guy. And it's like, oh, I, that, I was only. I didn't really mean that. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, no, exactly. I didn't mean it. Yeah. Well, it, it, the whole idea of bringing the 400 year old vampire into your house. But I think when she saw that, she's like, got him. There it is. I think, you know, she's let's looking see. for somebody to do I got that. my little she's qualification like, list. No matter what. Um, I got a qualification yeah. list. Must be capable vampire. of violence. I'm rifling right. through people, and I see yeah. 400 year old vampire. Oh, that's the guy. That's the guy. That's that's what I'm saying. Anybody starts talking about split personalities, I and they're telling you about it. Yeah, that's the one you want, man. You know, I'm not telling about it. You go out there and do that. I'm just saying, yeah. Yeah, her in her situation, if you come run across that, that's your boy there. And, and and look, like I said in the beginning of this thing, if we were talking about a woman who was being beaten by her husband and she shot him, we'd probably go. Eh. He probably yeah. earned that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not defending the mother by any stretch. I'm just saying, no. yeah, I think she might have been shopping for some help. Yeah. One of those tape replays. Yeah. One thing you've been very open about is um, your relationship with Nick. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the abuse. You mentioned just kind of, you know, some of his dark mm -hmm. desires. Mm -hmm. Something that really bothered me when I was watching the act is he comes across a little sympathetic towards the end. Mm -hmm. They highlight his autism. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about that? Or And despite what Nick did to you and your mother, mm -hmm. do you have any empathy for him being in prison and what he has gone through? Um, you know, I, I think that we both, like him and I, both have a lot of regrets. Um, you know, obviously, I wish that this would have never happened this way. Now, for him specifically, um, you know, I did my time. I know he's doing his time for his part of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I hope that whatever he does with his future, because he is spending the rest of his life in prison, um, I acknowledge that I am the reason for that. However, I don't feel either that it's a situation where it's a sympathetic type of situation. Okay. And I, I mean, the, the reason why I say that is because in my past relationships, I've had two relationships since I've been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And each one of my exes and even my husband is like, baby, if you would have asked me that question, if you would have said, hey, can you kill my mom to get me out of the situation? They would have said no. Okay, no, we're not doing Except that. Let's go to the police. Let's go let's, to the police. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna get you out of this situation, but let's go to the authorities, all right? And and we're going to do this the right way. He did not, Nick did not say that. You know, he, he has these dark fantasies. He wanted to do it. It was a fantasy he lived out, and he's paying the consequences for that. So with that being said, you know, it's neither here nor there for, in my opinion, what I think of the situation. It's just, it is what it is. Have you been able to you know, come to peace with that night or have you relived that night over and over in your head? And I kind still, of, you, yeah, I still suffer from, you know, PTSD um, and, and trauma. Um, I keep reliving this one nightmare over and over again and it's tied to that night. It's tied to the house. Are you able to share that? Um, so, yeah, and, and I've had actually two nightmares that reoccur a lot. Um, so the first one my therapist said is attributed to the guilt that I feel for not reaching out to other people. Um, to help me out. Um, so the first one that I have is I have a cell phone. I'm I'm in my in my dream. I'm holding a cell phone and I'm trying to call my dad. And the number for some reason I can't get through to him. Mm. The number doesn't work. The phone is turned off or whatever it be. I can't get through to him. And I have that nightmare again and again and again. Um, and then the other one is about that night and. Um, I keep on going back into that house and just feeling very frightened. And, you know, the murder just happens again and again and again in my mind. Like I'm not, I'm free physically, but I'm not free from the trauma. Yeah. 
you obviously have regret, Mm -hmm. right? So looking back, is there something you would have done different to protect yourself and ultimately save your life? You know, this all started as a child, like as a toddler. So I grew up in a household where my mother said that She had magical powers and she'd put a voodoo hex on me if I ever tried to leave. You know, my mother suffered from a lot of mental illness. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So, um, you know, my mom used to say that she heard voices and saw shapes and, and things like that. So, you know, for me, I think the regret goes back so much further than the crime. I wish that even as a little girl, I would have maybe even said something like, mommy hears voices. You know, and just started telling and just people, started telling people yeah. uh, you know, some of the smaller things that was going on. Maybe if it, even if it didn't make sense to me, right? You know, just kind of make those comments. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, what have I got? What what video are we doing? Hang on, seven. <laughs> yes. Seven. Okay. Yes. Um, let me look at my notes. <laughs> Where yeah, is it? Okay. Six. Uh, no, it seven. is. It is seven. It is seven. Okay. It is seven. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Therapy. So bringing an authority here. Therapist says that uh, that she has feelings of guilt. Um, so and, and the, so there is an authority that she's bringing in to say that she is suffering here. I, I don't doubt that she may well be suffering. I don't doubt that she may well have guilt. But again, it, it it's quite a it's potentially a, a very conscious move to bring in a, some kind of authority figure to say, look, it's proved. Don't even question it. Um, nice uh, double uh, reoccurring nightmares. Nice double finger wagging on that baton gestures there to make sure that she is suffering. She has two nightmares and therefore we shouldn't question that she feels some kind of not not remorse, Not responsibility. We haven't got any of that so far. Maybe some accountability, but for stuff that happened before that, but uh, that she feels some suffering around this. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I I agree with you. And I just want to talk about the difference between a few things. Telling the truth, believing in what you say, very different things, and then marketing. And one of the ways I've always heard marketing describe is most of the truth well told. And maybe that's what we're seeing here. I think we're seeing that third option. And the difference between this and deception is that these statements she's making are mostly honest, probably worked out in a therapist's office somewhere instead of a lawyer's office. And also, they're not designed to deceive and manipulate. And that speaks a lot to me. And she seems to be more open than what I would initially assume. I opened the videos in Dropbox this morning and I was like, okay, she's just got out of jail. She's going to be on a campaign and just show everybody how perfect she is. And she's not going to show any vulnerability. She's going to be really locked down. She's not going to talk about any, any insecurities or any flaws. It's the opposite. We're seeing the opposite of that here. Just surprising. Scott. All right. When she's talking about reliving the nightmare, we see five times we see micro expressions and there it's of two of them. It's three contempt and two of anger. So I thought that was really interesting, which makes sense because she's talking about something horrific that happened to her. And then as well, that single shoulder shrug comes back, then things return. And that lets us know that she's um she's not sure about what she's unsure about what's going on, about what she's talking about. So every time she talks about the details of what happened that night. So that's where that thing starts popping up because she's she wants to talk about it because she's not sure. Uh, maybe she's not sure about how much she should information she should give out. Maybe she got away with that, got out earlier just by the skin of her teeth, and she's trying to watch her mouth and make sure she doesn't say something that gets her put back in the pokey. So, and then we're seeing those thumbs steepled like that when the woman asks her a question and she answers. We see those thumbs go up, and she's confident about talking about the the dream she had. So there's no problem there. I think she actually had those dreams and all that because we're seeing those, those thumbs as she, as she's talking about that. And then she's back to her baseline, just behaving like the rest of that interview. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to keep it really short. You guys covered it all, except for I'm going to endorse what Mark said about her bringing in authority. If you want to know whether she's doing it intentionally or it's something else, it's very clear. 
because she moves around a lot in the chair when she says it. And then she locks her fingers and starts to adapt immediately as soon as she says that. So, Mark, I agree with you. She intentionally brought this in. Now, is that good or bad? I agree with you as well, Chase. She's showing vulnerability because I think she has to. If you're going to rebrand, you have to say, yeah, I did kill somebody, but I'm not that person anymore because I'm rehabilitated. I think if you're going to tell the story, this is the way you tell the story. Now, I think they're also making her pretty comfortable at this point, those two interviewers. One of those tape replays. Have you been able to you know, come to peace with that night or have you relived that night over and over in your head? And I kind still, of, you, yeah, I still suffer from, you know, PTSD um, and, and trauma. Um, I keep reliving this one nightmare over and over again. And it's tied to that night. It's tied to the house. Are you able to share that? Um, so, yeah. And, and I've had actually two nightmares that reoccur a lot. Um, so the first one my therapist said is attributed to the guilt that I feel for not reaching out to other people. Um, to help me out. Um, so the first one that I have is I have a cell phone. I'm I'm in my in my dream. I'm holding a cell phone and I'm trying to call my dad. And the number for some reason I can't get through to him. Mm. The number doesn't work. The phone is turned off or whatever it be. I can't get through to him. And I have that nightmare again and again and again. Um, and then the other one is about that night. And um, I keep on going back into that house and just feeling very frightened. And, you know, the murder just happens again and again and again in my mind. Like I'm not, I'm free physically, but I'm not free from the trauma. Yeah. You obviously have regret, Mm -hmm. right? So looking back, is there something you would have done different to protect yourself and ultimately save your life? You know, this all started as a child, like as a toddler, So I grew up in a household where my mother said that she had magical powers and she'd put a voodoo hex on me if I ever tried to leave. You know, my mother suffered from a lot of mental illness. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So, um, you know, my mom used to say that she heard voices and saw shapes and, and things like that. So, you know, for me, I think the regret goes back so much further than the crime. I wish that even as a little girl, I would have maybe even said something like, mommy hears voices, you know. And just started telling people. And just people, started telling people, yeah. uh, you know, some of the smaller things that was going on. Maybe if it, even if it didn't make sense to me, right. you know, just kind of make those comments. Uh, you started this conversation, you were referring to other interviews and um, that one interviewer just calling you a murderer. Yes. Do you feel that way about yourself or do you feel more as if that you're a survivor? Um, I don't, I don't associate myself as a murderer because if you think about it, yes, I had a part to play in it. I requested, I asked Nick for help and how that conversation started was, you know, he was saying that he would protect me from anyone. I said, anyone, he said, yes. I said, even my mother, he said, yes. And then the, the plan kind of formed from there, but he's the one that did the actual kill not me. I can't kill anyone. That's why he's in trouble to begin with, because he's the one that did it. So when they say I'm a murderer, I don't identify as that. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm an accessory. Absolutely. I'll take, oh yes, I did that. I am an accessory to murder. However, that doesn't define me. I did, I did my sentence. I did my, my part, you know, I did what the judge wanted me to do. Now that that's over, let me live my life. Let me re, re, reinvent myself. Absolutely. Give me a chance. Yeah. Because before I didn't even have that chance to begin with. So let me show you guys who I am as a person before you just start slapping labels on me. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So she she puts forward this idea of if you think about it, like like I maybe haven't been thinking about it before. So, okay, I'll, I'll have a good think about it then. So if, if I think about it... Um, uh, she says, she says, I don't identify as a, as a murderer. Well, that doesn't mean that you're not a murderer. State I mean, of Missouri does. Yeah. I mean, the state of Missouri, <laughs> I think you're a, I think you're a murderer. I mean, I get that you don't identify that. And, and I just went away and I thought about it and I came back having thought, as you asked that, no, I mean, you're still, your, your identity under the state of Missouri is one of a murderer. That's why you were in prison, as far as I understand it. And yes, you can want to identify as something else, but that doesn't mean that I have to join in just 
doesn't. And the state of Missouri clearly isn't going to join in on that one either. So I did think about that one. Uh, so there's a, there's a logic here that says I don't identify with that. And, you know, if you think about it, I did not do the actual kill. So again, if you didn't do the act, well, that's a beautiful phrasing there, the actual kill. Then she goes on to say that I, I can't kill. Uh, again, interesting wording there. Doesn't mean you won't <laughs> or you didn't. <laughs> I mean, just you can't. Mm, interesting. Uh, so, and then beautiful, biggest, biggest change that I've seen here is that tonal change there on uh, reinvent myself. And I think it kind of nails down the rebranding exercise that that we feel may well be going on here. And she marks that out for us. Uh, reinventing herself. And so, yeah, she really does have to have to start to tell us a, a story chase, a piece of marketing, which in my mind is some but no, not all of the facts put forward in a certain order and dimension to get a certain result out of the market. And so, and so I think the story is, is that you will not identify me as a murderer anymore I'm, I'm something else and um and i've i've rethought about everything and i'm not the person who did the murder i'm a very different high ground to them uh, chase what do you got on that one yeah and it's the second time we're hearing her use these words do the kill or did the kill uh in just in these videos and she may have misspoke uh, but she says, I can't kill anyone, like Mark, you pointed out right after this. I think she might have been trying to say, I didn't. It's a strange phrase, but I don't think it's worth a lot of attention because, there's, I mean, there's not a single other behavioral marker that we look for tied up here that I see with the statement. And I think her use of the word identify is just her ability to instantly absorb whatever is popular on TikTok uh, like her voice, the way she speaks, and all of that. So maybe she's just soaking that up, and I, I don't know. But then she says, let me reinvent myself. Uh, give me a chance. And this is really truthful and surprisingly honest and vulnerable for her to ask. And I think most people her age would be way too concerned with looking like they're perfect and flawless to say anything honest and real like this. And, or, or maybe most people similar to her behavioral pattern, having just gotten out of prison, much less to literally be vulnerable and then ask the world for a chance to actually ask the world for a chance. I'm still having trouble with the severity of the vocal fry, but it's something I'm going to work on. I'm going to ignore it as much as I can. I don't hate her at all, but I do hate the vocal fry uh, that we're hearing. And I bet her real voice is way better. Scott, you're the audio guy. What do you got? All right. All right. Mark, I think you nailed it. When she says, I don't identify as that, those right there, when you hear somebody say, I don't identify as, you got to tread lightly around them because that can get you canceled if you go ahead and say, you are this or you are that. You got to be super careful. So she's she's using that to protect herself. So because you're right, she's hearing that you're right, she's hearing that stuff on the internet. She's hearing or, or on TikTok. So when you when people start talking about how I don't identify as this or I didn't identify as that, that's that common nomenclature for you stand back. Here's what I think, right or wrong, whatever you think is right or wrong. Here's what I think. I think this is no different than that teacher who got her student to kill her husband. Remember that one? She was like an eighth grade teacher or something, and she talked her student into killing her husband the same type of thing she worked nick and she worked the court system and now she's working these people to believe she's innocent and hadn't really not much to do with it or at least she didn't execute the kill like you guys were talking about a few minutes ago in other words she found a loaded gun that wanted to shoot something and she aimed it at her mother and it shot her mother even though he stabbed her so that's what we're dealing with here this is not going to be popular in the comments and you know what i don't care this is what i really think Greg, what do you got? Well, I'm going to take a step further. So if, you, if you're not popular, you go. I'm going to be really not popular because I agree with you 100%. I think she almost came out and said what I would have done if I were in her shoes. She's Again, she's got to say, I kill my mother. But what she says, if you were in any interrogation on earth and I was walking down the list and she said, 
The reason he is in trouble is because I couldn't kill anyone. That's not an embedded confession. I don't know what it is. I would tear that apart. I'd unravel it and just crawl all over her with that and start taking the sentence structure apart. So let's back up. I think the problem is what she doesn't know is these people are being friendly. And so she becomes more bold. And the way she talks, I think, is starting to come out. Now, I, I'm going to get close this with when I finish telling you what I'm seeing with why I don't. So what? But she does long filler words in the sentence. If you think about it, she's navigating language when she's doing that. Her eyes defocus. Watch. She's internal, all internal when she's talking. Her eyes are just sitting out in space, not looking at anything. And then she fancies up that language. Mark, you hit it. I requested. I ask. She's trying to request that. She's putting that in. And then she's surprised the guy actually did it. Come on. We're back to the 400-year-old vampire. She's so socially unaware, I think, as a person. She's not been in a situation where you could get away with talking a certain way. And I think the male interviewer senses that she's treading on something very dangerous here. Watch his feet. Watch his blink rate. Watch all that nervousness come back. I think that's what we were seeing earlier is he, she's socially awkward and he knows it. But that the reason he is in trouble is because I couldn't kill anyone. Are you kidding me? You probably would almost say, come back, back out and say, Look, I, I did ask him to kill my mother because I couldn't, and that was my only way out. But she doesn't go far enough to take blame for it. Mark, you're a theater guy. There's a line from Oliver in in this movie, I mean, in the in this interview. In, in Oliver, there's a song, I forget what it's called, I Do Anything For You. You know the song? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a kid in the, in the one where the kid says, I'd do anything for you. Would you fight my bill? Anything. And so it reminds me of that every time I hear it. I'm watching this thing. And her voice goes to childlike when she says anything by anybody. Guys, that she is telegraphing how much manipulation was going. My opinion is we're seeing an embedded confession and we're seeing her saying what actually happened. Again, now I'll close it with this. So what? Her mother tortured her for how long? So what? That's all I got. One of those tape replays. Uh, you started this conversation, you were referring to other interviews and um, that one interviewer just calling you a murderer. Yes. Do you feel that way about yourself or do you feel more as if that you're a survivor? Um, I don't, I don't associate myself as a murderer because if you think about it, yes, I had a part to play in it. I requested, I asked you, Nick for help and how that all conversation started was you know, he was saying that he would protect me from anyone. I said, anyone. He said, yes. I said, even my mother. He said, yes. And then the the plan kind of formed from there. But he's the one that did the actual kill, not me. I can't kill anyone. That's why he's in trouble to begin with, because he's the one that did it. So when they say I'm a murderer, I don't identify as that. I'm, 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 I'm an accessory. Absolutely. I'll take, oh, uh, yes, I did that. I am an accessory to murder. However, that doesn't define me. I did, I did my sentence. I did my, my part. You know, I did what the judge wanted me to do. Now that that's over, let me live my life. Let me re, re, reinvent myself. Absolutely. Give me a chance. Yeah. Because before I didn't even have that chance to begin with. So let me show you guys who I am as a person before you just start slapping labels on me. Just one more thing. Mark, this is Clem Fandango. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango. What have you got? Well, here's what I've got. Um, well, I, I mean, it's fascinating, really, because we are always fascinated with people who kill their mothers. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the things you're not meant to do. And so an extraordinary story. I think she's putting on top of that this Cinderella tale of inside uh, the 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 potential monster which we shouldn't see her as there is a princess story in there somebody changed but but where it seems to go wrong is she doesn't take any responsibility for the murder so so as a story told and as a piece of um rebranding there's just one of the mechanisms isn't really address now to address that mechanism would be kind of hard work and so she's doing an easier piece of work of trying to rebrand and just steer around 
the main thing that everybody's interested in, which is, did you really want to kill her? And how does that feel like? I mean, that's what everybody's interested in is, what does it really feel like to want to kill your mother? Like, what does that feel like? What happens? That's the fascination. And that's what she's steering around. And, and I think, look, I mean, I think, you know, she'll be able to keep us hanging on for that moment until she maybe doesn't deliver that and we get bored uh, of her. Uh, so I hope she makes great choices as she moves uh, forward in the world. Chase, what do you think? I hope she writes a book. I'm sure. And she I hope will. it does well. But uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot of deception markers that we normally see in these kinds of videos, which I thought was shocking. I think this shows that when people think of behavior analysts or body language experts, they default to lie detection. But truth yeah. detection, emotion detection, comfort detection, and I think, in my opinion, most importantly, shame detection are way more important skills to have than deception detection. If you really specialize in learning how to see the truth, the deception stuff will automatically jump out at you. And you won't have to spend a long time just deep in negativity. As promised, let's talk about Munchausen's. There's a difference between malingering and Munchausen's. Malingering is about material reward. Munchausen's is about emotional reward. Only one of those is a psychiatric diagnosis. Both of them have very extremely similar behaviors, though. It's the motive and motivation uh, that makes the difference. So maybe we're seeing something else. Greg? Yeah, so what we did see is sorrow. We did see when she's talking about her mother, we saw sorrow. When they ask her, do you miss your mother? Yes, we saw sorrow. We saw remorse in a person. I think, I, I doubt she'll watch this, but if she did, I would. what I would say to her is just say, look, yeah, I killed my mother. If you manipulated the guy to get it to happen, yeah, I did that. It was my only way out. It's the only way I understood to get out. Yeah. You're almost saying it anyway. And I don't think most people would feel horrible toward you. Yeah, it's, it's horrible someone had to die. But at the same time, it's also equally horrible that this child, this person that you're supposed to protect, you have tortured to the point that it's normal for them to be deceptive. I think she does a very good job of saying, look, deception is in me and I'm trying not to do it. I'm you know, I'm rehabilitated. And I think all of us would reward that. And to your point, Chase, if she writes a book, I hope she makes a ton of money so her life gets easier because she's had a hell on earth in the beginning and really a horrible way to go, Scott. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I think she did. Uh, she came up with a plan. She said, I've got to get somebody to do this for me. She went in there and found somebody, the perfect candidate for that. And like I said before, she found a gun that wanted to shoot something and she pointed at her mother and it shot it. Now, having said that, what else would you expect? She's been brought up by a con. She's been brought up by a mother who is psychologically unstable. And so she learned from her mother that to have turned out as quote unquote normal as she looks right now. Well, that's that blows my mind. She can sit down and talk to anybody and carry on a conversation and think about things in the future and how I want to do this. And I want to do that and find somebody and fall in love with them. It's blows my mind because of the way she was raised by a monster. Anybody who would do their child like that, I'm not, yeah, the, they deserve it. I, I think the mother completely had that coming. Whether that's going to be popular or not, I don't care again. But but at the same time, her mother's the one that turned her into that. Her mother's the one that gave her the tools to be able to think that way. Her mother's the one that okayed all this horrific stuff that was finally dawning on her. She got a little bit older and said, you know, something not right about this. This I'm looking at these, everybody else is normal. And, and and she probably Googled it and said, leukemia, or the cancer was, you don't get this with that. What, what's going on here? And it probably dawned on her that her mother's been playing her like that and using her. So I don't blame her a bit. You know, I don't blame, I, I think, uh, what other route could she take to get out of that? How else could she get out? Just keep playing along? No, you got to get out somehow, because that has to come to an end at some point. And the point it would come to an end was, is where the mother would have to off her. I would be under the impression, because she's built up this lie, this lie, this lie, this lie, and the child isn't dead. So the child at some point, no matter what the age, is going to have to 
pass away to make everything okay for the mother, from what she said so far, to keep her ego intact. So she doesn't um, have a problem with her ego and maybe off herself. So I think she, I, th I think she, in her eyes, she did the right thing. And you know what? In my eyes, I think I don't see how any of us would have done any differently to get out of that because that, as her mother, that's not her mother. I mean, it was technically, but that mother didn't love her like she's supposed, like a mother's supposed to love a child. That didn't happen. I ain't dating a vampire. Turned, yeah. So the child turned on her, and that's what happened. That's my opinion. I could be wrong, but I think that's what happened. And if you want to come for me in the comments, come on. I don't care. I don't care anymore. I don't care. <laughs> All right, fellas, think this is another good one. We'll see you next time. So what do you got? Thank <laughs> you.